Hello, and welcome to another Worship in the Gap. This is Jim McKenzie, Interim Minister at First Congregational Church in Port Washington, Wisconsin. I wanted to give you a little update on a few issues in church. We have two members that have passed away just recently, Lloyd Smith and Paul Tudis, and we keep their families in our prayers. We had a new baby born. Don Gushel's grandson was born three weeks ago. And uh, last weekend, we had a very wonderful week at church. It was our call weekend, and we had a new settled minister that is called and will be beginning in the, the 1st of January, January 1st. So we're, we're very excited and, and looking forward to that. We continue to work hard on uh, looking at in-person worship as well as continuing our virtual worship in the gap. One other item I'd like to uh, address with you is Jim Melikar. I so wish that you will keep Jim and Sherry and their whole families in your prayers. Have you ever heard the phrase, your walk talks and your talk talks? but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Have you ever heard that before? Well, you might be interested to know that Jesus subscribed to that theory. He did. And the reason I know that is because of the parables he taught, just like our passage today. But before I get into that, I need to explain something to you about reading the Bible. Some people will just pick up the Bible and, and begin reading a passage without knowing that there's a larger context or even understanding what that might be. Sometimes knowing the context can make a huge difference, like with today's passage. My best friend used to say that a text with no text is pretext. Do you like that one? A text with no context is pretext. It's important to know what the larger context to a story is so that you know how the particular reading that you're looking at is situated in the larger context. It would be a little bit like reading Orwell's Animal Farm and thinking that what you were reading was just another cute little story of, of farm animals without understanding that there's this whole big backdrop of the Russian Revolution and Orwell's opposition to uh, Stalinism. You just appreciate more the underlying context and you get more out of the story. The bigger the context, the more you know. I often encourage people when they pick up the Bible to take a look at what immediately precedes the passage they're going to read and what immediately follows. Because you can be sure that the stories in the Bible are interconnected with each other, very closely interconnected so that they can tell the larger story. People are often surprised at how much they can learn and, and what they come to know that informs their reading just like today's passage. Well, speaking of today's passage, you'll notice that, that I'm in an apple orchard. This is the closest that I could come to a vineyard. So work with me here. But I'm, uh, I'm out at my favorite apple farm, which is Barthel's in Mequon. And they were kind enough to let me uh, set up here in, uh, in their front apple orchard. I want to tell you a story uh, that Jesus told. It's actually a parable, and it, it occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It dawned on me that maybe not everybody knows that all of the stories, all of the parables, are not in every gospel. But this one, called the parable of the vineyard, or the wicked tenants, actually occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In keeping with our theme, let's take a look at not only this parable, but what occurs in Matthew right before this story. 
What occurs is a story, another parable of two sons. And the dad says to the one son, I'd like you to go out into the field and, and work. And the son says, sure, dad, I'll go. But he never goes. And then the father says to the second son, I want you to go out into the field and work. And he says, there's no way I'm going to go. I don't want to go. And yet a little while later, he went. Who do you think was the faithful, loyal son? Well, that's the story that comes immediately before this story today, uh, which is the story of, of the uh, wicked tenants, or what is called the parable of the vineyard. This is what it says in Matthew. Listen to another parable. There was a land landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves, his servants, to the tenants to collect the produce, his produce, his rent. But the tenants seized the servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned yet one more. Again, the landowner sent other servants more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son, saying, Surely they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir, the heir to the property. Come, let's kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because he was regarded as a prophet.
Interesting parable. Imagine if you were one of the people standing around in near a vineyard and you heard Jesus tell this story. Um, obviously, the landowner had assets invested in the vineyard. He had leased it out to the tenants, and all he wanted was his share of the rent. So he sent his servants to collect that, and the, the, the tenants, they beat and they killed the servants. The landowner did it one more time. They beat and killed those servants. Finally, the landowner says, surely they will respect my son. They wouldn't harm him. But in those days, possession was nine-tenths of the law. And so what they did is they saw their opportunity and they took the son and they killed him. The landowner obviously was quite enraged. And so what he did is he went and he threw those tenants out of the vineyard and he would lease it to others. You see, the message here is that the landowner is interested, God is interested in those who produce fruit. God is interested in those um, who not only say they will go into the field, but that they will actually go and do the work of the Father. The original tenants said that they would care for, in the parable, essentially Israel the vineyard, God's people, but they don't. They only use and abuse them, lining their own selfish pockets. And Jesus said God had had enough. Well, I suppose the same could be said for us, couldn't it? Those of us who have been entrusted with such a wonderful world, those who have been entrusted to care for one another, those who have been entrusted with the kingdom of God. The question becomes, what do we do with this opportunity? Do we produce fruit? If not, will we face the same fate that the earlier tenants did, that they will be kicked out because they don't produce fruit and don't give back to God? It's only those who bear the fruit, who actually go out and work in the field, who care for this world and for one another, that is the faithful, loyal son. You see, those Pharisees and chief priests, they said all the right things. They, they were like the first son in the first parable, where they said, oh yeah, we'll go out, we'll tend to the field, we'll tend to Israel, and yet they didn't. They dressed up in fine garments, jewelry. They had plenty of wealth. They used and they abused the Hebrew people. And God said they were not the loyal, faithful sons and they were not the right tenants to tend the vineyard. I guess the question becomes for us, what will we do? How's it going for you? I've been asking myself the same question today. When God's servants come to collect their share of the harvest, will they find that you and I have produced much fruit or that we are only interested in talking the talk? Remembrance of me, hope and the 
Speaking of the vineyard, today is Communion Sunday. And I would invite you to take your little cup if you've come by the church this morning and received your, your little packet with a wafer and juice inside and, and join me for a moment. But let's pause for a moment just to consider that question. How are we doing tending the vineyard? On the night in which Jesus took bread, he gathered with his disciples and at one point he took a loaf and he said to the disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, take eat for this is my body. And so they did. They took that bread that Jesus offered, that he had broken as a symbol of his body that was about to be broken for them. And they ate the body of Christ. Scripture tells us that in the same manner, Jesus took a cup, a cup of wine, a simple cup of wine. And he said to them, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood, which is shed for you. And when he had blessed it, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes, the life-giving blood of our Lord. Would you pray with me? Dear God, on this day, this day that we remember the vineyard that you have given to us, this world, and ask that we be good stewards of it, Help us to share all the fruit in the kingdom, the fruit that the Apostle Paul talked about, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And may that be gifts to the world that will point people to you. Help us to be faithful stewards of this world and this life that you have given us. And help us, O oh God, to love others just as much as you loved us. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, so glad you've joined us again today for Worship in the Gap, um, right here in Barthel's front garden or front vineyard, front apple orchard. I'm glad that you've joined us and I would ask you one more time, stay well, stay safe, and stay faithful because I'd like to see you next time right here in Worship in the Gap. <laughs>